Hi, and welcome to today's presentation on bone marrow biopsy and aspirations, the essentials. My name is Terry Camp, and I'm the senior, cl senior clinical affairs manager for the interventional oncology division. Um, just a few housekeeping items before we get started in introducing our presenter today. Uh, if you have any questions regarding on control and today's presentation or anything else related to Teleflex, please submit them through the Q&A widget at the bottom left of the dashboard. As we are able to, we will respond directly within that widget during the presentation. Following the presentation, for those uh, questions that are directed to Krista, I will share as many as possible with her to answer live. Since time is limited, any questions that we have and we can't get to by the end of the webcast, we will respond directly to you by email. Additionally, we invite you to check out our resources related to today's presentation on the upper right of the dashboard. So finally, it's my pleasure to introduce today's presenter, Krista Kunit Gaynor. Uh, she's a nurse practitioner and proceduralist at the Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville. Krista is a very accomplished in her career in the stem cell transplant division. She, currently, Krista has performed over 20,000 bone marrow biopsy procedures and has educated her colleagues, physicians, and fellows in performing um, the fine art of doing this procedure. So um, we are honored, definitely, to have Krista here. And um, wait, Krista. Okay. Hello. Thank you all for having me. I'm very excited about getting to talk about this with everybody. Obviously, as Terry mentioned, I've been doing this for a very long time, so I do have a few little pearls and things to discuss as we go through the topics that are ahead. So thank you for joining in today, and I'm going to try to get started. I don't really have any disclosures other than I am working as a speaker for Teleflex. There's the disclaimer to look through and a quick course description, but I'm going to start basically with the course objectives. Um, what I'd like to do is go through um, the historical milestones in bone marrow biopsy and aspiration. Um, this was a great review for me too as we started looking into it and identify relevant anatomy and physiology related to the procedure recognize indications for bone marrow biopsy and aspiration, and understand the benefits and technical advantages for the new powered bone marrow biopsy drill that I have recently started using within the last couple of years, demonstrate key procedural steps and best practices in bone marrow aspiration and biopsy. So I'm going to start with a historical perspective, which was very interesting to me as I was reviewing. To be honest, I was had a um, question at a trivia night for our local um, Vanderbilt group and they asked me when the first bone marrow biopsy was so this was great to have reviewed this. Um, the first guy was Giovanni Gadini and he published two papers in 1908 describing the process to obtain bone marrow in living humans. He was unique in that he was the first person that actually was looking for it in a hematological capacity. All the other investigators at that time were mainly trying to look into the bone marrow for infectious process and treating that but he started the process in the hematology area. He's known for quoting this quote, if the bone marrow constitution had been known during the person's life, peculiar and often inexactly defined morbid conditions would have been found their pathogenic explanation and exact diagnosis, meaning it would have been so helpful to have bone marrow at that time to be able to decide what was going on with these patients before they actually um, had passed away. He used for his procedure an electric steel drill, which is what I thought was interesting in connection to using the power drill for on control in that he did a two millimeter diameter little incision into the top of the tibia, used a scalpel and a glass syringe, and his he did a very similar thing to light microscopy, which is what we use now, um, looking at these samples. The major disadvantage was the tibial site did not have very much hematopoietic, if any, tissue. What you might find is stem cells in that part of the bone that were more yellow marrow, which would be going into bone or um, cartilage. So he didn't get as much information from that, but it was he was kind of ahead of his time in looking into those kind of things at that point. Um, after that approach and that historical po component, it was moved kind of into a sternal approach to getting a bone marrow biopsy, and they used two needles at that time. They used um, one to aspirate and one to get a core sample, which is very dangerous in the fact that you only have about a centimeter um, of your sternum to use. So in current 
day and age, it is used very rarely in the event that you basically have no ability to use, use the pelvis and not done in people younger than 12 for obvious reasons and also there's a growth plate there. So these biopsies are not done very often at all. In fact, I know of very few in my 20 some years of doing them. So the gold standard of course now is the pelvic bone approach. This is the manual needle that's been used since 1971, but they did start doing bone marrows in the pelvis in the 1940s. But this was a development that was helpful in that and most of us know that as the jam sheety needle. Um, as we move on, here's the pelvic area that we're trying to get to. It's when you're doing a bone marrow biopsy, fortunately we can't see that well to see exactly where to go, but there's the area that we need to go. We're moving on to the basics in education. Um, here's an example of a skeleton with the area of bone marrow everywhere. Obviously the pelvis is the main area and it makes up about 50% of the bone marrow in the body. All the areas in red also are great areas where there's bone marrow and we have about 5% of our body weight in bone marrow. We produce about 500 billion blood cells a day. And most of us that are on this probably know this already, but obviously we're trying to get the hematopoietic stem cells which lead us into red cells, white cells, and platelets and important in diagnosing. So here's the structure of the bone. Of the bone. First we have the periosteum, which is what we're trying to get through as we're getting into the marrow space. We have the red marrow and the spongy bone all in this picture. You can see that there's nerves and blood vessels and the inside of the bone with the spongy part that's very important in getting your actual sample. And here, as we're all trying to get the stem cells when we're looking at the slides to get the particles and spicules that will eventually become platelets, white cells, and red cells. Here is a great slide of the aspirate after it's aspirated. So what we're trying to get is the semi-liquid marrow after pulling like negative pressure into the syringe. This can be fast because you're pulling the bone marrow directly. I don't actually recommend pulling it very fast because it hurts the patient a lot more. I kind of have a slow approach to that. And then make a slide and as you can see in here, you can see the spicules on the slide. There's the different cell lines, so that's part of it. It provides for flow and molecular studies. And while you're in the biopsy room, you can see if you're in the marrow, a lot of times based on if they can see these spicules and make a slide smear that looks similar to that. One drawback of just the aspirate is that it doesn't represent all the cells. That's why it's incredibly complementary to have the bone marrow aspirate and biopsy as part of what's needed for, diagnos for diagnosis. Moving on, here's the actual biopsy, the core biopsy that's a great sample there. Um, we're trying to remove a small solid core of marrow through the needle. It is, helps with overall cellularity, trilineage hematopoiesis, and marrow architecture as you're looking at that core sample. And also allows for analysis of cells and stroma. And it represents all the cells so you have a better picture of what's going on. Also, you can review about dry taps. So um, it could just be that you're not having a dry tap, that you might just be in the lo wrong location. Or it could be that you have a fibrotic area of the marrow or um, part of the diagnostic part of the procedure. So it's helpful to know exactly what that involved. Um, one kind of downside of, of the core part is that it does take a little bit longer to get the result with that, but it's kind of a combined process because they have to do decalcification. So getting the full result back, um, our institution says it takes about five to seven days, or at least that's what we're supposed to tell the patient um, because that way they're not disappointed if it's done faster than that. Here's a mnemonic that I just learned um, while doing this presentation about why a dry, tape, dry tap may have happened. My ham has dry marrow. So it goes through different diagnoses that might be a part of why it would be a dry tap, including my, myelofibrosis, metastatic carcinoma, Hodgkin's disease, acute leukemia, CML, and hairy cell leukemia. Most of my difficulty um, with getting um, a dry tap has been mostly with myelofibrosis because um, you can just keep trying and you get fibrotic areas repeatedly. So um, that has been my experience, but all of them can be something to evaluate. 
So we'll just kind of review what is indicated for a bone marrow biopsy, like what are we doing it for? There's lots of reasons. Some of them um, are just part of a workup and not understanding what's going on. So they have unexplained anemia. So usually primary care, somebody's working that up, may have gone to a hematologist, and we're getting to the point that we don't know what's going on and we need a bone marrow. Leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, or pancytopenia, all of which might be sending to us to get a bone marrow biopsy. Also, unexplained elevation in your count, so polycythemia vera, thrombocytosis, leukocytosis, and some of these might be precursors for another disease that might be impending, so those are all important things to evaluate. Diagnosis and staging of lymphoma and solid tumors, we all know that part of that sometimes is knowing if there's involvement in the bone marrow, so you need that to have an accurate stage. And also diagnosis and evaluation of plasma cell disorders like multiple myeloma and then other leukemias. All of these possible things for bone marrow. And then occasionally if they have iron metabolism issues that we can't figure out with laboratory testing, um, might need to do a bone marrow as well. Moving on to the next slide. We also do a lot of bone marrows for amyloidosis with deposition and storage diseases such as that. Fever of unknown origin, that used to be, in my experience, done a lot more than it is now, but sometimes there's an infectious process going on and they need to do a bone marrow with all of that workup. Um, unexplained splenomegaly, counts might be normal and they have their spleen, they need to figure out what's going on. Our practice ends up with a great deal of bone marrow biopsies from mastocytosis. So that could be coming from like an allergy person or um, even rheumatology sometimes when they can't figure out what's going on with the mast cells. They'll come with a tryptase level already done and the bone marrow helps complete that picture. And then also in stem cell transplant, um, we do something called RFLP, which helps us understand if it's donor or original patient cells. So we can see if the transplant is working well. It's been a great indicator. I've worked in transplant for a lot of years, and it's very helpful in knowing where we're going with the tr transplant. So a quick review of contraindications for a bone marrow biopsy. That can be hemophilia, DIC, and other related severe bleeding disease disorders. Thrombocytopenia is questionable in that we still do bone marrows even when platelets are very low and just do hemostasis longer and watch the patient a little bit longer. Sometimes if the person has had a lot of bleeding or there's issues with that particular patient, platelet transfusions might be needed ahead of time. And it probably is somewhat dependent on your institution and how you manage that. But that is something to consider as well. Potential complications, there, it is a relatively safe procedure. Obviously, people that are trained well and know how to use the devices, it goes better, but there are some side effects to that that can happen. A lot of that is attributed to the needle penetrating the iliac bone's inner cortex. Um, that can be a serious thing. Sometimes you can get near a nerve and someone jumps suddenly or whatever, or they feel excessive pain, I sometimes will consider changing locations just to make sure we're not going near a nerve on the procedure. That's something to think about. Additionally, bleeding and infection and pain can occur. As I mentioned, if there's severe pain, it's sometimes hard to evaluate because some patients have pain when you actually start the process of finding the location. So it's hard to assess how that pain is, but if you know the patient and they're having severe pain, I always consider that something to be concerned about if you're near a nerve or something like that. So I, in all my years, I've maybe one time seen a person have an infection just because it's a sterile procedure and we follow it pretty closely. So as I mentioned before, bone marrow biopsy and aspirate going together are very complementary to each other to get an accurate result. Together, they add something. The biopsy is useful in assessing the overall marrow cellularity, trilineage, hematopoiesis, and marrow architecture. The smear is crucial to assessing the differential count and the morphologic dysplasia. Here's a slide about having a good sample. Now, this particular slide is really deciding on the sample and how it is when it gets to the lab. When you're in the procedure room and you're deciding about the sample, it really is more based on when we draw the first aspirate and they make a slide to see if they see spicules and then we move forward and get the rest of the samples and then the core, they can evaluate that by seeing if it looks spongy, if it has that honeycomb appearance and then also if there's some part of it that looks a little bit smoother, we might be a little bit in the subcortical part of the bone. So that part is evaluated during the procedure 
this is when they get actually to the lab and they can look at the samples and decide and hopefully get great results from that. They can look overall cellularity, the presence or absence of cellular monotony and large cells. Then send for studies with power microscopy, special stains, flow, and molecular um, testing. Here's another thing, pathologists are wonderful. They can do all of these different things as part of the result that comes from the readout following the bone marrow biopsy. You have the morphology, the flow cytometry, cytogenetics, and immunohistochemistry, all of which um, give us part of the result that we need. And here is the pelvic bone approach, part of the diagnostic issues. And there's the on-control driver, which has been a part of our practice now for a couple years. It's a single needle technique. It can either perform aspiration alone or with both. Most of the time we're doing both. Very rarely do we do one. And it is uh, battery powered. The clinician guides through the outer part of the bone to access the marrow cavity, and you're getting through that periosteum, and it goes very easily. It's a much easier procedure. Another aspect of the on control is the different makeup of how the needle is. The outer cannula has crown cutting tips designed to go through the cortical bone, and it also has a, a wire capture needle, which I have found very helpful because in all of my years of doing the manual drill, we would sometimes lose the actual sample as you're coming out of the bone, but this captures it, and I don't believe I've actually had that issue at all any longer. We have much larger samples, potentially less discomfort. I do have patients that say all the time with the new drill that about the time they start feeling the pain, I tell them the procedure's over. So that's very helpful. Here's a study analyzing the manual versus the power drill. Um, and the biggest, one of the biggest differences is the core size. We can get so much better core sizes and not have to go in to repeat it at all, really. It happens most of the time. I rarely have to do a repeat core attempt and the samples and the pathologists are much happier with that. Here's an example of the quality of the specimen, one being with the manual needle and then the other with the on control. And thirdly, the, the length of time for the procedure. It was a lot more common to have to go back for specimens, as I mentioned, and that going into the bone is easier to penetrate, and this, the procedure is done very fast. I find it funny sometimes to think about, because I used to work with a physician who used to try to have his biopsy length be the shortest of anybody at Vanderbilt, so he, he missed out on this. All right, compared to manual powered bone marrow drill device, it has a higher quality of specimens, which we just talked about. It's easier and faster to get the retrieval of the biopsy. This mentions reduces radiation exposure, and that's obviously referring to if somebody is under fluoroscopy or going to interventional to have their procedure done, which does happen. There's less physical effort required for the needle advancement because it will just advance easily. Rapid access for difficult bone lesions, it can get to those as well. Common clinical challenges here, similar to what we just discussed, the manual needle has difficulty getting or penetrating the bone. Many clinicians with not very much upper body strength may have difficulty, and the needle can bend. I did have some issues with bending the needle as well. Sample size inconsistencies, you can see the two different sizes. It has been very easy to get an adequate sample. And time, as we just mentioned, it can be a much faster procedure. And here again, as we just mentioned before, high quality samples, unique cannula design, dependable performance, and less patient pain, all of which is important to have a successful bone marrow biopsy. Okay, um, this is the part I've been doing forever and ever is to go through the actual procedure. So we're gonna start with that. One of the main things that's fantastic is to have a great team. I work with amazing people. I have great nurses, we have great technicians, we're all friends, we get along well. Pathologist is part of the procedure as well. He is not obviously in the procedure room. And plus or minus an anesthesiologist. We do not have an anesthesiologist doing our procedures at Vanderbilt, but um, I know a lot of institutions do as part of that procedure. Um, and we, we have um, hopefully made a great difference with patients in that great teamwork. Preparing for the bone marrow is part of the procedure too. Making sh we, we call the patients the day before and go over their medications. That has been a big change in that we don't have to hold all the anticoagulants any longer, whereas before there were several days it would often have to hold the medicines. 
determine tests that are needed. That is usually done by the hematopathologist now and part of the testing, but the oncologist as well as the APP could be calling or adding some different tests that need to be sent off. Determine the patient's need for anesthesia if it is offered. We just do mild sedation, usually with Versed, but they also need to have that discussed if that's an option at your institution, and then obtain a signed consent. That also um, is incredibly important. The other thing to think about is if they're on a study and they would need to sign a consent for that as well. And sometimes we have to draw a separate location for the um, research that they might be on because the PI may want that first sample of bone marrow for his study. So here is the start of the procedure and finding the location that we need to do the procedure. I think finding the location is a very important part of whether you have a successful bone marrow biopsy and looking at landmarks. I like to do the midline and the top of the iliac crest. A little bit of that depends on the size of your fingers, but mine has been four and four, four finger breasts down from the top of the iliac crest and four finger breasts over from midline. The physicians that trained me, it was three and three. There's also like the five point procedure or um, landmarking. Finding the iliac crest and um, finding the location can be difficult, obviously with certain patient and body habitus, but that is one of the critical parts. And some people don't do prone. Some people do their biopsies lateral decubitus. So um, that is also slightly different in your finding your landmark for that as well. Then you mark the spot, which is there, clean and sterilize the biopsy site, um, open the bone marrow kit, and then start anesthetizing the skin. I have found that anesthetizing the periosteum or numbing that whole area has been incredibly beneficial if you take the time to use the lidocaine in that area as well. And I have kind of a larger location that I do because I'm usually not perfect at the target practice, so I kind of numb all in that area and try to make that go the best for the patient. Just kind of going in and out of the periosteum. There's a, an example of getting into the bone marrow, going a little bit ipsilateral into the um, cavity. But first of all, we want to get into the right spot and seed the needle and then attach the driver as you're going in to aspirate the bone marrow. We first do the first pull, like we talked about before, to check for spicules or particles, whichever terminology you use, and make slides to make sure we're in the right spot and then draw additional samples. We do usually about three poles and about 15 cc's on just a normal bone marrow. Then reattach the driver with the needle out to get the core, and you kind of redirect to get a two centimeter is the ideal optimal specimen size. Our institution is happy if we at least get over one centimeter, but that is, and it, that needs to be of actual good core sample as well, not just cortical bone. Then the lab tech will analyze the quality of the core and decide the length and if they think it looks good, if it's spongy, and so on and so forth. This is a just a overall procedure with the manual biopsy. I'll just go through that briefly. Um, the differences in that is that you're, as you're going into the bone, that drop into the marrow space is not nearly as dramatic. After using this for 20 years, I started to feel a little bit of that, but it's, it's not as dramatic. When you're using the on control, you can feel that drop into the marrow space nearly every time, and you can almost see it as well. So when going with this one, you go in, you can feel getting in there, and then you'll take the actual stylet out and see if you're in the marrow space, and then try to aspirate. Getting the core is a little bit different because you want to make sure that you're keeping that inside the needle. So this says to rotate 10 times left and 10 times right, which I did do often, and then slowly remove the needle counterclockwise. It was more of a kind of move and all around um, way of trying to just make sure that that needle was staying in um, the side. There are some manual needles though that do like cut that off at the end, and that is a little bit helpful in keeping the core in there as well. All right, here's a more perpendicular um, direct into the marrow space picture. Um, but sometimes you have to repeat the bone marrow biopsy. If it's not an adequate sample, if, uh, if it's not really spongy, sometimes I'll have a sample that's beautiful size-wise, but you don't see the component of the bone that we need for the procedure. So that sometimes happens. And then I was also going to mention some, some studies do require more than one core biopsy as well, depending on... Um, what study the patient's on. Then we apply a pressure dressing and 
for hemostasis for 10 to 15 minutes is part of our protocol and then follow the hospital protocol for post-procedure care. We have a number of people follow and then if they have had Versed, obviously no driving for 24 hours as well. Um, okay, in summary, uh, comp the bone marrow, aspirin, and biopsy are complementary to each other. The pelvic bone is the standard of care, kind of reviewed how we got there, which is much safer and a much better place to get a bone marrow from. An effective, effective team includes um, all of the people and communication is incredibly important. And using the powered biopsy tool is associated with better outcomes, including larger, better quality samples. And I have found that to be true. All right, so if you have any questions, thanks for listening to me and I'm happy to answer any or please contact me if there's something that I can help you with. Thank you so much, Krista. Your presentation was amazing and very informative, and we certainly appreciate your time and effort in uh, preparing for this. Um, there were a few questions that actually did come through during the procedure. So um, one of them was, uh, is it difficult, or was it difficult for you to change how you do bone marrow procedures going from a manual to a powered device? It, it was not difficult for me. I'm not sure if that has to do with the years of working or or not, but I transitioned to that very easily. Actually, uh, when you came to show us how to do it, I felt like it was very self-explanatory and I adopted it very, very easily. And I found a huge difference over the years. People had brought up the idea of doing a drill and I kind of at that point had the attitude of, we're doing okay. If it's not broke, why fix it? But once I started doing using the on control, I found it to be very helpful for patients, for myself. Obviously, it's much easier on my joints. <laughs> and it's easier to get into the bone marrow patient and have a much better um, satisfaction with the procedure. So um, it has been, been beneficial to us, and that's been for about two and a half years. So it was not a hard transition for me at all. In fact, it was helpful. And then um, another question was, uh, what do patients feel like about the on-control on procedure device? Um, do they feel it's better for them or uh, do they yes. prefer manual? Yes, and we often have um, patients that have had them done at outside institutions that were done the other way, and they're like, oh, I, I have to come where you guys use the, um, well, they just call it the drill, but I got to come where they use the drill so that I can have a better experience. So that has been Oh, I would say over 90% of the patients are very happy with the transition and in fact are very unhappy when they have it done at other places than they don't have it. So yes, it's been great. Um, one last question. Uh, let's see here. Um, can you describe any improvement in sample quality? Yes, yes. Um, our pathologists are incredibly helpful or astonished with that change. So that was kind of one of the things that helped us transition into getting there because we were having some issues with doing repeat bone marrows. So we kind of just had the pathologist review the cases back and forth and, and it was a great change for them because they said the samples were so much better. So yes, it has improved. Okay, great. So we don't have any more questions that came through on the chat. So I wanted to again, again, thank you, Krista, for your time and uh, and your presentation. It was phenomenal. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks for having me.